show his love for us. And he can't do that. He, he can do that, but he won't do that. He won't do that when our lives are so busy and filled with noise uh, because God doesn't have to compete with anybody. He doesn't have to compete with anything, and he's not going to. Right, exactly. And, and I think that a lot of that just has to do with, um, I think there has to be a balance of some sort because when you look at the life of Jesus and you look at the life of the disciples, um, or even or the apostles in Acts, for example, you know, um, it wasn't like they lived a life of silence or the apostle Paul, right? But we know that silence was part of their life. Jesus had silence part of their life by when he went by uh, part of his life when he went to the mountains. Um, so I think there's, there's a concept there that some, some take the extreme. Well, that means that we should never speak and nothing against that, but it's, it's a very intriguing thought. And then some say, no, that that's ridiculous. We should just stay busy and just keep moving forward and doing the work of God. I think there's a balance there. And I think they both, um, uh, support the other. E- oh, each one supports the other. Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I just have to say this because my wife brings this up all the time and she's, she's absolutely right. So often it's not either or it's both and right you you look at that it's not all the time in silent retreat it's not all the time in running around activity there's there's it's both and right you 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 have some time for one you have some time for the other jesus modeled that perfectly which makes sense because he was what both god and man right but I would say, having said that, and I'm kind of, you know, talking out of both sides of my mouth. You ought to try that sometime, Steve. It's really entertaining when people watch you do that, uh, <laughs> talking out of both sides of your mouth. But on the other hand, <laughs> I would say that if there is something that we are in need of in our culture today, it is the idea of appreciating silence. Oh, absolutely. And that is one of the things. When we get off track, and this is true in any aspect of our lives, when we start to swing off track in one direction, often we have to go pretty far in the opposite direction just to try to bring us back to middle. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and that's where we depend upon God to guide us and and make sure. So I guess the, the main message possibly or the main challenge would be not to be afraid of silence because I've heard many, ever since the invention of the radio or even going into the TV especially and now with laptops, cell phones, iPads, whatever, um, the idea of silence is very difficult. And many people have said that I've done it before. I have turned on the TV when I'm not even interested in watching anything. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, people, I, people want that, I, that white noise, right? The background yeah, noise. Yeah, for, cool. for whatever, for whatever reason. I like the like to hear the noise. But there are and, certain things that you just have to practice. Look, if you care about it, and if, if, you, if you don't care about hearing from God, then fine. Keep, keep the radio turned up all the time. But if you care about that, uh, it's a practice like anything else. Same thing for reading, whether it's scripture or uh, or anything. You you have to be diligent about it. And then once you start doing it, riding a bicycle, exercising, whatever. If you're diligent, you build that up, it becomes easier and easier. And at first it may seem difficult to be silent, but do it for a little bit at a time. Uh, it will grow easier and the, re- the rewards are just tremendous. Right. And and I think the one thing we could learn from John Flavel and this tweet and his account is that even if we look back on some of the history and of any uh, um, era of Christianity, um, that we may even disagree with some of their beliefs or some of what they said, we can appreciate the, what the Puritans did and what they accomplished, and we can learn from them. Oh, ab- ab- Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you can take parts of people. You do not have to take all that they are. Right. Uh, Well, correct. You don't. And ladies and gentlemen, I must say, Mr. Segway not only just struck again, but Mr. Segway just took the wild man by surprise. As he just introduced our next song, here is All I Am by Roborn and Stowinski.
Metal Talk with Wildman and Steve. Yes. So, oh, you know that song by Roborn and Stowinski, All I Am. And there's been s- several Christian songs with the same theme. And that's a great theme to have. You know, the idea of All I Am, I'm surrendering All I Am to God. Um, we hear that in worship songs. We hear that all over. That That is something that I think the, the Christian community has really been pushing and challenging for several years probably 30 years, maybe 40 years, of Christianity is not just what you do on Sundays. It's not just what you do at church, but it's your whole life. So with that being said, there is ChristianMinuteWork.com. David David Hilgendorf runs this podcast, Christian Minute Work. If you want to live out your Christian faith and experience true joy and purpose in every part of your life, including and especially where you spend most of your life in your daily work, check out the Christian Minute Work podcast where you'll be inspired by interviews with everyday guys from all walks of life and different vocations, as well as work-focused messages to motivate you and help you in your journey and walk with Jesus. I highly recommend that podcast, Steve, because that is something that people can listen to that can help them stay focused in the workplace because, let's face it, Every time in a church you bring that up, you have people listening because people who are following Jesus are surrounded by people who don't. Oh, absolutely. I mean, again, you look at Scripture, you look at Paul uh, as a tent maker, you look at uh, other disciples as fishermen. Uh, These guys had regular jobs, okay? They were were out working uh, with, with other folks, and so that was the best way to share then the good news, you know, while you're working with somebody. I mean, the best conversations I have uh, sometimes with my children are while we're working on some shared project. So let's stay with that for a moment, Steve. I'd like to, you call these curveballs. I don't call them curveballs. I I call them enlightening uh, inquisitors. <laughs> Is that a word? Okay, it, Did it, I just it make that up. Lightning inquisitors. Okay, <laughs> we're going to do something with that at some point. But go ahead. Yeah, right. So, and enlightening. Yes, yes, enlightening. You know, you, it's not a curveball, even though it seems like a curveball. You're not on the spot, even though it feels like you're on the spot. Okay. So I have a question for you. When I was in college, 
we were at a Sunday Sunday evening service, and a, and there was a, a powerful movement taking place. The guest preacher just finished preaching uh, the strong message on witnessing, and how you need to share your faith. And it prompted me in the moment. I got a few of my friends together. We went down to Town Square that night on a Saturday night. I'm sorry, it was, a, it was no Sunday night on a Sunday night. Town Square, where every, all the high schoolers, everybody hung out down there. We went around and we just started to engage people in it, direct discussions about witnessing, about Christ, witnessing to them, you know, just stopping people and saying, hey, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about the Bible? And it, it brought out interesting experiences. And I think it's, it's good for everybody to, every Christian at some point to do something like that because it does teach you some things about how witnessing works, how it do, what, what doesn't, what's the best way to engage people. But at that particular service, a school teacher stood up. Now, here's the curveball for you, Mr. School Teacher Steve. Okay. Um, or, I'm sorry, the enlightening inquisitor. <laughs> <laughs> um, was that he stood up in tears, testifying, because everybody was, te- it was like a revival service. So everybody was sharing at the end, testifying, and the minister was listening to everybody testify what the service meant to them, what they were going to do. And he said, I feel so prompted today that tomorrow I'm going into my classroom. And I am sharing the gospel, even if I'm risking losing my job. Is there a question in there? What say you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely think that you know anybody who follows Jesus has got to be willing to do so even unto death. Right. Jesus is very clear about that. He says, you know, if you put your hand to the plow and turn back, uh, you're, you're not even you're not even fit for this, right? You're not even set. You're not even cut out for this kind of stuff. Um, he says you've got to be willing to take up your cross every single day uh, and follow me. And the cross, while well, today maybe just a symbol of you know, jewelry, uh, when you say that in in the first century, that was an execution symbol. And that's all it was. It was a means of execution. So following Jesus can mean to the point of death. And whether that's physical death or the death of your career, the death of a friendship, I think Christians uh, who are really sold out, who, who follow Jesus, you've got to be willing to do that. Absolutely. That said, I don't think that you do your best witnessing work by going out and deliberately trying to offend people. Mm. If the gospel offends somebody, the gospel offends somebody. But let it be the gospel that offends them, not your manner of sharing it. Okay. Uh, and, and I often talk about this kind of thing. I talk about communication a lot as a language teacher. I talk about communication with my students. And, and you think about the doctor who comes in and says, you know, the results came back bad. Get your affairs in order. You're probably not going to be here 30 days from now. Wow. That's, that's, that's pretty rough. Okay. It's blunt. It's true. It's accurate maybe, but it, that's pretty, pretty blunt. Then there's a doctor who comes in and says, hey, I want to talk about the results. You know, we, we talked about there were several possible outcomes. And uh, it turns out we, we didn't get the ones that we wanted. Okay. Uh, it, the way the results have come back, it looks like it was the, the worst scenario. And what I'm going to suggest to you, this is a time for you to call your family in, start making some preparations, right? That's the so-called bedside manner. Well, which one's more effective, right? Which one do you want to hear in that moment? Uh, you don't want to hear the person who is just bluntly, rudely trumpeting, even though it's the truth. So I think there's got to be a, a friend of ours, a uh, wild man, yours and mine, uh, Mark Middleberg, apologist, evangelist. Uh, he often likes to use the word winsome. Is our mm-hmm. speech and behavior, is it winsome? Uh, does it really win people over? Does it draw them? Uh, to Jesus, uh, or is it coming like just a blaring megaphone? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's so challenging because, again, we're going back to some type of a balance because that individual, and I didn't even know him very well. I mean, I was a college student. He just happened to be a teacher that was coming to that church. I do, I would say, if you were to ask me, was he sincere? Yes. Um, Would I say I admire his uh, willingness and his obedience? Yes. And I never really heard what took place or what happened after he made that statement. So I think that we also need to be careful not to squelch somebody's passion 
um, and maybe say something to the effect of we appreciate and we admire the passion, but how about you do it this way might be more effective. Well, and even more so, don't squelch.